Hello, it's Scott Manley here. 50 years ago this week, Apollo 10 lifted off for the moon with a crew of Tom Stafford, John Young and Eugene Cernan. Cern this was going to be the final all-up test before landing on the moon. There were some things that they still had to test and could only be tested in lunar orbit. In particular, the lunar module had a landing radar which needed to be verified. They also needed to test the abort guidance system on board the uh, lunar module to make sure that if the Apollo guidance computer failed that the LM could still get back to lunar orbit. For this mission, the lunar module would be called Snoopy, and the command module would be called Charlie Brown. The astronauts picked these names, and after this mission, the powers that be at NASA decided that astronauts were supposed to pick names with a little more gravitas, which is why we got Eagle, Intrepid, Aquarius, Antares, etc, etc. Names that would look good in the history books, names that would stand the test of time. But on that front, the crew of Apollo 10 may have had the last laugh because Snoopy is the only lunar module that has flown in space which is still intact. So most of the lunar modules were abandoned in low lunar orbit and because the lunar gravity field is a bit rough, all of those have ended up crashing into the moon at some point. Uh, some of them came back to Earth, notably Apollo 9 and Apollo 13 ended up burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. But Apollo 10 wasn't like any of the other Apollo missions. So, of course, the crew took this lunar module out, they did a whole bunch of trial landing approaches, and then, of course, they tested the abort guidance system with a few problems. I'm a bitch. This is where they were separating the descent stage and lost control of the vehicle. Okay, let's... Let's make this burn on the axe, babe. But they quickly figured out the problem. Make this... Make this burn on the axe. The AGS is the abort guidance system. It's the backup to the main Apollo guidance computer, which, uh, you know, was only supposed to get them back into orbit if there was a problem during the descent. Hello, yes, uh, Trippy and uh, Charlie Brown are hugging each other. Oh, roger that, we heard him down here. But after the descent test, there was one final experiment they wanted to perform with Snoopy. They wanted to burn the ascent engine until the fuel was entirely depleted. Okay, Joe, F burn inflation is 108-50-3100 plus 455-76 plus all balls minus 06231. The burn to depletion was of course programmed into the Apollo guidance computer on Snoopy. Actually, detaching Snoopy was performed using the explosive separator. So they would actually drop a part of the spacecraft by triggering an explosive charge that would split the docking point adapter along this plane. Give you a five count. Four, three, two, one, fire. Snoopy, Snoopy was detached with the program running, holding the attitude until the correct time when the signal would be sent to fire the engine, and that would take it off into interplanetary space. We know the orientation, we know the amount of uh, delta V that was acquired during this maneuver, and so using that you can actually predict where it would have gone. And that's exactly what Mike Lukes did a while back. These diagrams are from an article he wrote on his website. Now, he had three different possible configurations based upon the information they had. So he followed these forward. More or less what happens is the spacecraft escapes into interplanetary space with a relatively low delta V. Most estimates put its period at about 342 days, which means it comes back to Earth every 15 years or so. And like a loop pattern like this. Now, people have actually been looking for this spacecraft because we don't know exactly where it is and finding it again would be very good because you could constrain the orbit. This is the orbit simulated in Kerbal Space Program with realism overhaul because, of course, I've been asked, what would it take to bring the Snoopy spacecraft back home? And so that's what I pretty much spent my weekend doing. I designed a spacecraft, it masses about 5 tons, and it launches on board an Atlas rocket. Now, I only put 4 boosters on this, I wish in retrospect I'd put 5, but, you know, whatever. This is, of course, accurate in terms of its mass and its performance, so I wanted to do everything as accurately as possible. 
Despite the fact that it took the massive Saturn V to put it around the moon, we can actually possibly have a chance to recover it using a far more modest launch vehicle. That's why I went with the Atlas V. A Falcon Heavy would probably work as well. It turns out that Snoopy has a characteristic energy, a C3 of like less than four, which means that it's actually very easy for anything to get to once you can reach escape velocity. The big problem is, is because it only comes near Earth every 15 years, the lowest velocity way of encountering it is to you know, set up, set up your intercept on one encounter and then you rendezvous with it part way through and then then you modify your trajectory so that you eventually come back to Earth. This upper stage mass is about 5 tons, which means that it's well within the capabilities of Atlas, Falcon 9 or the Delta IV. In fact, the, it's very similar to the upper stage of a Delta II. It's got an, uh, an AJ-10 engine which uses hypergolic fuel with uh, several tons of fuel. Now, the difference here is that it needs some way to grab the space probe. And I decided to use the docking adapter, but of course... I did this at a time when I had forgotten, or I somehow had forgotten that they had sort of permanently severed the docking port and therefore it might not be the best way to grab the spacecraft. In real life you would also have the issue that the spacecraft has been floating in deep space without any attitude control and it's entirely likely that there is some asymmetric reflectivity or emissivity which will cause the spacecraft to spin up over time. There's a combination of light-based effects that's called the YORP effect, that's Yarkovsky, O'Keefe, Radvieski and Paddock. And it's just down to your differential absor absorption and re-emission. And that can basically start your body spinning faster and faster. And the lunar module is a very small object which has quite a lot of different um, you know, materials on it and it's relatively light. So by the time we get to it, it's entirely likely that it's spinning on its own. So grabbing a lunar module in space is going to be harder than simply docking with it. You're going to have to arrest the rotation and then grab something which is relatively fragile because, of course, the lunar module was made to be very light. It was made to be just strong enough. But you know, astronauts commented that if they hit the side of the lunar module hard enough, they could have knocked a hole in it. Anyway, coming back to the design I used, I used the AJ-10 engine because you need to have storable propellants that can last for the 15-year life that this spacecraft is going to have. You could use uh, hydrogen and liquid oxygen, but that, of course, boils away. So instead, storable propellants is what you use. We also do a lot of the maneuvers using these small reaction control thrusters because, of course, the big thruster has a limited number of ignitions and you want to save that for the moments when you really need a big oomph. As I said, this is very similar to a Delta II upper stage, but the big difference is, is that it has to have the electronics and the communication, the avionics to communicate. It also would need to have an entirely autonomous capture system because this would be so far from Earth that it would not be able to do things on its own. And yeah, I actually had problems. In fact, I found that the docking ports I had used were completely busted, so I had to do some save game editing. But after that, it's a case of trying to plot a rendezvous. And of course, this is using Principia, which is the Kerbal Space Program mod that does n-body gravitation. It does proper, accurate modeling of, of orbits with n-body effects. And these are, of course, the great spirograph patterns that you get when you are changing the reference frame from the sun to the Earth. Because what I'm trying to do is figure out how to get an encounter with the Earth after using the least amount of uh, Delta V. And in the end, I've got one here, and we, of course, then need to trim it so that we can actually make the capture maneuver. Now, the plan here is to put Snoopy into an Earth orbit, but not a low Earth orbit, because putting it to a low Earth orbit requires way too much fuel to be spent circularizing the orbit. We just want to send a spacecraft that can take the five-ton lunar module and slow it down when it flies past the Earth. Now, when you're doing capture from deep space, you want to get down close to the Earth because that way you're actually using Earth's gravity to reduce the amount of delta V you need to perform the capture. If Earth wasn't there, you would actually need more delta V to match the orbit. Because you fall down into it, you get this uh, square law where you're adding your velocity squared and 
listen, it's just a simple thing to do. You drop down into the gravity well and then you perform your burn there. And then it becomes, it means you need less delta V to perform this. And it's this big capture burn, which is why you need that big AJ-10 engine. The smaller engines would have been fine for most maneuvers, it would have taken a long time, but because you want to maximize the effect of the Earth's gravity, you need to make that capture burn as short as possible. So you take the penalty of having that big engine and that big nozzle in return for the fact that it lets you slow down a lot faster and take advantage of the Earth's uh, gravity field. And so yeah, you don't need a massive spacecraft if you want to recover Snoopy, you just need to have patience, you obviously need a rocket that can throw something into interplanetary space, and your spacecraft needs to be clever enough to be able to grab onto this ancient piece of hardware. But once captured, you could do some space age archaeology on the only lunar module that flew. So I hear you ask, what would you find in this? Well, one thing we know we'd find is the trash, because the trash was offloaded from the command module into the lunar module. And that might include one particularly famous piece of space trash. The Apollo 10 floating turd. We don't know who did it, but you know, if that was recovered, it might now be possible to figure out who was really responsible for this. Now, normally the poop was actually returned to Earth for analysis by people that have too much time on their hands. But this one, it looked like they just grabbed it out of the air with a tissue and probably tossed it in the trash. So it's entirely possible that this historic piece of evidence is still floating out there in this spacecraft. And so maybe modern forensic techniques would let us identify which of the three individuals was responsible for this. But, you know, of course, it's really something that you just want to put in a museum. And that's the next thing. So we're putting this into an eccentric orbit. To put it into a low circular orbit, you would need another spacecraft with more fuel. But, you know, you could wait until the thing was captured before sending that up, and then you could use a more efficient rocket, such as a hydrogen-oxygen engine. But how would you bring it back home? Well, the lunar module doesn't fit into most spacecraft, and in fact, most spacecraft, they drop their fairings, the aerodynamic fairings. So the only spacecraft I can think of that has been talked about which would be able to capture this and then bring it back to Earth is currently Elon Musk's Starship. But before any of that would happen, we would have to find and positively identify Snoopy. We have found various pieces of hardware floating around in space which are lost, but Snoopy so far, uh, there are possible candidates, but it will take years to figure out if it's the real thing. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.